Good evening, everybody. I'm Megan Castillo. I'm Town Hall's Program Manager. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live stream conversation with biologist Wen Fei Tong. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continued use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization, a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, even if we can't gather together in person. I'd like to thank Wenfei for appearing tonight to help make this possible. Town Hall will continue to produce virtual content this fall, including our podcast, In the Moment, which features exclusive guests. And many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming programs include Michael Sandel with Anna DeVere Smith about the myth of meteorocracy, Jill Lepore with Margaret O'Mara about the advent of data mining and its use to influence human behavior, Andrew Embry with Jen the Sky about whether America is fated to decline as a great power, and more. Town Hall and the nonprofit community at large has been put under significant strain due to event cancellations and the ever-changing landscape. We hope you will consider extending your generosity to help support us during this difficult time by making a donation and becoming a member. Click on the donate button at the bottom of your screen, or you can make a donation online or text Town Hall to 44321 to give. Our partner booksellers have also been hit by the negative effects of the COVID outbreak as well and can use your support. We encourage you to support local independent bookstores by purchasing a copy of the book being presented tonight. Use the link on this live stream page to purchase through Third Place Books. For viewers who want to watch this broadcast with closed captioning, we recommend viewing the stream via our YouTube page linked here in the chat. To enable real-time closed captioning, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The video will be available for rewatching immediately following tonight's broadcast. Tonight's presentation will be about 30 to 40 minutes followed by Q&A. We will select questions from those submitted in the Ask a Question field at the bottom of your center of your screen. You can also vote on which questions will be addressed by clicking the arrow next to the question to upvote it. We can't guarantee we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arnold Matulski Science Series is supported by Microsoft, KUOW, Wincote Foundation Northwest, and the Taxpayers of Washington. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching tonight. Wenfei Tong is a biologist with a passion for understanding and conserving the natural world. She has a PhD in evolutionary biology from Harvard, where she is currently a research associate. Her research interests include the evolution and genetics of cooperation and conflict between and within individuals, particularly with wild zebra and mouse societies. With family structures and mating systems and with grassland and brood parasitic birds. She has been a keen birder since the age of 12 and shares her love of birds through her paintings, photography, research, teachings, nature guiding, and writing. Her first book, Bird Love, The Family Life of Birds, was published earlier this year and is a stunningly illustrated look at the mating and parenting lives of the, wor of the world's birds. Tong's new book, Understanding Bird Behavior, An Illustrated Guide to What Birds Do and Why, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Wenfei Tong. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming here tonight. And I hope the fires and the smoke are not too bad where you are. I'm in Missoula, Montana right now. And so I think we're about to get the smoke tomorrow. Um, but that's the price you pay for living out west, right? Where it's beautiful. So I, I wanted to share this image of a yellow warbler, which I took uh, years ago, probably 15 years ago or so, when I was doing my PhD at Harvard. And it just symbolizes to me a lot of what birds mean to me and what I would like to um, get across in both my books in terms of both the very uplifting, uh, very beautiful, almost spiritual aspect of this kind of connection you can form with nature through something as beautiful and visible and um, the, the fact that they fly makes the birds very, very appealing as well, I think. And um, in addition to that aesthetic 
aspect of things. Because I'm a trained evolutionary biologist, I think it's really important that people, especially now, appreciate how valuable the scientific method is and how much all of us as um, interested bird watchers or you know, even if you just have birds coming through your feeder every day, how much you can contribute to what we understand about the world and how that can essentially help us um, keep what we love most about the world around for as long as possible. So just to give you an idea of what I mean by uh, what birds mean to me, I thought I would start off with an image of a slide that I drew as part of the acknowledgements for my PhD thesis, where it's very customary for, undergrad, uh, for PhD students to sort of end their talks with all these thanks to people who mean a lot to them. And since I was about five, I think, I would associate people with animals and, and give them, so, so like front and center is my mother, who's a Doberman pincher, and my father's a tiger in this. So they're not all birds, but um, in the top left corner, you see a satin bower bird. And that's one of the professors who really, really influenced me and inspired me at Princeton, Henry Horn, who's uh, recently passed away. But he was both a very, very curious, insightful scientist, but also a wonderful artist. And bower birds are known for building these lovely um, bowers with which to woo females. And so I thought that was a suitable animal for him. But you, you can see that there's, um, in some ways, birds and animals in general have been a great source of inspiration for me, as well as a way through which I see the world. And so one of the things I've tried to get through in my books is um, how much you can learn, just not just by knowing why birds do what they do, but almost learning to identify with them in a very personal way. And so because of the whole COVID pandemic, I was spending a lot of time, I was living in New York earlier this year when the pandemic really hit. So we rode out the storm with the birds, um, which were fine because it was spring and they were having a lovely time. So I would sort of take refuge in the park every day and see all these birds that were, became like neighbors to me, which is what always happens with birds. I, I feel as though they root me in a place. And so even if I'm traveling, if I know the birds that I'm hearing and seeing every day, I, I really know where I am in a way that is, it's just like a separate channel with which to appreciate the world other than the human one that I also enjoy. And so there were Carolina wrens and house wrens that were singing at exactly the same place when I walked past the park every day. Or there were these fun cardinals who were um, having a lot of squabbles between themselves because they all wanted the same territory. Or I would see robins, so five or six pairs of robins, and I could follow their nesting progress throughout the spring. So even in an urban place like New York or in Singapore, where I grew up, um, birds are there and they're very visible and they're a perfect window into the natural world as well as into evolution. And um, the evolutionary theme, I think, comes up a lot in both books because I think it's really important not just to know what birds are capable of doing or the sort of gee whiz aspect of did you know that um, uh, um, a certain godwit species is capable of flying X number of days without stopping and so, so and so forth, rather than to know why they do that or why there's so much diversity in the natural world. So that's something I'd really try to explain in the books. Um, these are the two books. And this is a photograph. So I should mention that a lot of my, the photographs in this talk are in the books and they're mostly mine, um, but there are also a bunch of paintings and sketches that I'll show in the, in the talk, and those are not in the books, but the understanding bird behavior does have some beautiful illustrations in it. So I hope, hope you enjoy those. Uh, just to start off on some of the behavior, this is a photo I took in Kenya where I've done quite a lot of my field research, including on zebras. And in the foreground, you've got an acacia with a gray capped social weaver nests. And in the background, you've got Mount Kenya. And I chose this photo partly because I think um, one of the great things about evolutionary biology is it gives you this appreciation of the length of time that life has been on Earth. And sort of, it makes me marvel all the time that 
a lot of these species have evolved and existed way before humans came on the scene. And there's also a sort of sense of wonder in what we call convergent adaptation. So that's something I'll talk about more later in the talk. Uh, and I chose this photo of Kenya partly because it's East Africa that we've got very much the cradle of human evolution. And so whenever I'm there in the bush, I'm very aware not just of all the organisms around me, but also I get this feeling that I'm going back to our sort of human evolutionary roots when I'm in East Africa. And I, I just miss the place, especially now when I can't go there. Uh, but to, to zoom in on the grey capped social weavers, this is one of those nests close up with one of the social weavers still, still lining its nest with down feathers. And there's, there's a question I try to answer in the book about why some birds nest in colonies while others nest singly, like um, robins or something else you see. So, I mean, the, the, basic quest, the basic answer is it's got a lot to do with the distribution of food. And so if you think about the analogy with human cities, we've got um, lots of resources concentrated in cities, so we tend to nest or house, house ourselves in these large complexes versus people who are in more rural pl places and they need more space so their their homes are more spread out. Um, this is also another theme of the book is just both family life nesting as well as hiding from danger. So I, I just thought this is a cool photo because there's a nest in there and you can probably start to see it but it's so well camouflaged and it's a zitting cisticular nest. So I, one of my the things I did after my PhD was to work on grassland birds in Zambia. And this was one of the species. And we had to look for a lot of these nests with the help of some fantastic sharp-eyed field assistants. And this, the, the nest is basically bang smack in the center, but it's woven out of, it's sort of stuck together from the inside. So this is an aerial view of the same nest, stuck together from the inside with little bits of spider webs mostly to form a sort of cylindrical, almost like a Coke bottle shape. And they do this with live grass so that when you look at it from the side, you can barely see it. And you, you can practically step over this thing. I mean, it's, it's only about two, two inches tall or three inches tall. And the bird is tiny, it's about the size of a chickadee. And it was just, I mean, it made me marvel every single time I looked at these nests. So one of the things I try to do in these books is celebrate the diversity of all sorts of wonderful adaptations that birds have from, from this kind of nesting, which is so different from something like this robin, which is much more of a classic bird nest shape and, and still wonderful to something like those sitting cisticulars in East Africa. Um, and also I talk about things like you know, how, how birds like robins keep their nests clean. So this robin is about to take a little fecal sack from its chicks and, and fly it out of the nest so that they don't sully their nest too much. Um, and I, I remember I took this photo in the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I did my PhD. And I love watching robins. They're so fantastic how they, they nest all the way from Alaska down south to to you know, Texas or something, and they're so adaptable. So there, there's an emphasis not just on very, very exotic birds, but also on backyard common birds for anyone in the world, not just for people in North America. Um, and just to follow up on the robins, I thought since we were talking about nests, real estate is a, at a premium in a lot of places. And these wood ducks that I saw in New York really amused me one morning um, because the, they were sort of scouting as a pair for a good nest hole. They, they nest in holes and then their ducklings have to launch from the moment they hatch onto the ground. And you've probably seen these BBC videos where the ducklings sort of bounce on the leaf litter the moment they've hatched and then they toddle off after mum to the water. And I was so amused by these wood ducks because the female kept going from one hole to another in the tree, and the male was just following her and trying to. And he, and he ended up looking quite bored because she kept looking at one hole after another and deeming it unsuitable and moving on. And um, in the very top row, 
she's being mobbed by the there were a lot of starlings nesting in this tree as well and so they really didn't like having these wood ducks poking their heads around and so they were being mobbed so I, another behavior that's very common um, and which i talk about in the book is uh, this defensive behavior birds have called mobbing where they attack a, a bird or another organism that they think of as a threat usually to their nests and to their chicks and um, Another aspect of nests that I like is it's often used for courtship. So these weaver birds, for instance, have the males have to, so this is a male, and he's having to construct a really beautiful nest with which to woo prospective females. And there are some weaver bird species where if a female comes and she looks at the nest and she's not impressed, she'll actually rip it up and the poor guy has to start all over again. Or sometimes he has a series of nests, so maybe one of them will be will be appreciated, and someone will nest in that. Uh, so there's just so much diversity. And to segue from nesting and sort of using that as a signal of choice to to other forms of how birds choose mates, there's a lot in both books uh, about sexual selection. So this is the idea that. Um, you can have very exaggerated ornaments sometimes or weapons that are not very good for survival, but they're there because they help you pass your genes on. And so one question you could ask is why do barn swallows have such long tail streamers? Other swallows don't. And there was a beautiful experiment done early on in Europe where they basically cut off barn swallow feathers, the tail feathers, and glued them back on and did it in such a way that they could either artificially lengthen or shorten the tail feathers of males, as well as keep them the same as a control, and then see which males sired the most offspring as a sort of direct consequence of getting, having females be the most attractive to them. And really, they, they managed to show that males with the most artificially long feathers, much longer than a male could afford naturally, had the most offspring. So that was really good evidence in Europe of the fact that females are going for longer tail feathers, even though those tail feathers might be a handicap to males in terms of their ability to fly and their ability to get away from predators. And, you know, it's just like if you're trying to swim or you're trying to fly and you have a long thing streaming out behind you, it's not very aerodynamic. And um, the, the beauty of this is the same experiment was done in America, in North America, and they did found that North American female barn swallows didn't care a hoot how long their tail feathers were of the males. So that left everyone scratching their heads, which is what I love about sort of field biology and evolutionary biology in general is you try these things, you design these brilliant experiments, and then sometimes you just don't get the answer you're expecting. And in this case, the answer ended up being that um, it's how reddish the males are on the breasts that the females seem to prefer rather than the length of the tail feathers alone. And this makes sense if you compare North American barn swallows, which is what these two are, to European barn swallows, because North American ones have really, really um, relatively short tails, but very red fronts compared to European barn swallows, which have very white breast feathers and longer tails. Um, okay, I seem to be gabbling, uh, talking for longer than I expected. So I'll, I'll skip some of these, but these are sort of various images, drawings that I've come up with over the, over the past few years. Um, this is just to show you that chickens, like grouse, have all sorts of ways of strutting their stuff. And uh, this dusky grouse was charging me, so I thought that was a funny funny um, personal story to get across. Another thing that I try to explore in the book is why in a minority of species, you get a sex role reversal. So in this case, with these red phalaropes, the two larger, very beautifully ornamented birds, are actually the females, and the, the sort of docile one is the male. So I'll leave that as a teaser as to the explanation as to why. Um, and this is superb fairy wren. So this is a sort of backyard bird that's very common in Australia, even though they look 
really exotic to to anyone who doesn't live in Australia. They're very, very common in Australia. And they're fun because they're not only um, do they have this behavior called cooperative breeding where they live in groups and family members all help take care of the offspring of a particular nest, but also that they have really, really high um, frequencies of what we call extra pair paternity. So basically they have a lot of extramarital affairs is another way of putting it. And this male who's in blue, he's got those shiny feathers, is courting a female. And the biologists who study these birds found out that they never see males courting their own mate with flower petals. They only court the neighbors that they're interested in having a sort of little affair with, with flower petals, which I thought was just very amusing. Um, and 75% of the chicks in a given nest are likely to be fathered by someone other than the guy who's, who's officially the partner of their mother. So it's quite a high proportion of extra pair paternity. Um, another thing I talk about a lot in the books is sort of song. So, I mean, they're wonderful bird books uh, that deal only with bird songs. So I don't do a thorough treatment of this, but I do find it fascinating that birds um, communicate so well with each other. And of course, song is one of the most um, clear examples of this and very easily observed. And there was a paper that came out too recently for me to include in the books, but it's about these white crowned sparrows. Actually, it was about white throated sparrows, I'm sorry, different species. Anyway, um, the, the cool thing about a lot of North American sparrows is that they have dialect, song dialects. And not only that, but some of the song dialects evolve over time. So there's literally cultural evolution going on, which you can see in human societies too. So the parallels between bird song and human language are a very, very popular thing for evolutionary biologists and people who study linguistics to sort of look at the parallels between. Um, and to, to go on from that, there's a lot about bird social behavior as well. So I've got a photo of a raven here because one of the papers that I thought was absolutely fascinating was about how um, ravens, you know, we all, all members of the corvids, the crows, the ravens, the magpies, the jays, are brilliant and we, we know a lot about the, how they can make tools and how they can learn to solve puzzles and recognize individual people and so forth. Uh, the great thing about ravens is the study found that raven couples, they're very monogamous and all the couples have their own territory and they're, they're sort of like the power couples in raven society. But there's a slightly dark side to this because the power couples want to minimize any kind of social competition they're going to get. So they keep tabs on all the younger ravens who haven't formed a long-term monogamous relationship yet. And they purposefully sabotage the ones that are going to be the next couples of the world. They don't, they don't bother with the very young ones who haven't, who are, haven't even found someone yet. They focus on the ones that are likely to settle down with someone. And they, they literally watch them. And if they see these younger couples sort of being affectionate to each other or something like that, the, the power couples come in and, and just disrupt the whole thing and attack them and chase them away. I thought that was just so interesting that these birds have a whole society and politics of their own. And um, you might think, OK, corvids are very smart, but what about chickens, right? So these are vulturine guinea fowl, which are sort of arid adapted guinea fowl that live in uh, Kenya, and some, northern Kenya and Somalia. And at one of the field stations where I used to work, th there was a study that came out a couple of years ago where they tracked every single guinea fowl. And so they noticed that these vulturine guinea fowl hang out in crowds and flocks of about 60. What they didn't realize is that they seem to keep tabs on all those birds and they have their favorites. So it's almost like if you were living in Seattle or New York or something, and you spend a lot of time going to the same grocery stores and the same restaurants and the same bars as and the same gyms or whatever as everyone in your neighborhood, but you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily best friends and having dinner parties or having play dates for your children with the same groups of people. Um, I mean, you do have those 
so, sort of closer social interactions with the same subset of people. And it turns out that the Ultra and Guinea fowl do this too. So they might hang out in big flocks of about 60, but within that they have their sort of core group of 20 or so good friends or better friends that they, they tend to feed and roost with more within that group. Um, and another cool social behavior, this is mostly in California, is the acorn woodpeckers and Arizona, where um, what I've tried to depict on this tree is all these acorns that the woodpeckers have literally hammered little holes into the tree for, and then they sort of custom make the hole for a particular acorn and wedge the acorn in it. And they end up with these granaries of millions and millions of acorns, which they have to guard. And so this is another example of a cooperative breeder at times where you've got multiple birds sharing a single nest, and in this case, sharing a single food resource as well. So there's definite benefits to being in a group because of, obviously you can um, hoard more food, you can guard it better, and in theory, you can raise more offspring, which they kind of do. But there's also a lot of bickering and conflict within the group. And so that, that's the kind of social interaction I've always been very interested in exploring. And the acorn woodpeckers are one of the um, oldest and best established of these study systems, looking at both cooperation and conflict within the group. And uh, another form of cooperative breeding we've got is things like these Canada jays, or in Europe would be Siberian jays, which are closely related, where when times are particularly harsh, younger individuals won't be able to sort of branch out on their own and set up house on their own. So they stay behind and they basically help the older birds, the established birds, take care of their offspring and they help them form larders as well, a bit like the acorn woodpeckers. And they stick food onto the trunks of trees with, with very special sticky saliva, which is another fascinating adaptation. Um, I think I will skip over some of these. Okay, let's talk about brood parasitism, since that's one of my best loves. So this is a common meganza, which a lot of you will have seen, type of diving duck. And you'll notice she's got something like 20 ducklings. So it's not, not really um, imaginable that a female would be able to lay that many eggs, and she doesn't. The reason she's got so many ducklings is other females have dumped the eggs in her nest. And so when everyone hatches, she's got sort of extra, extra young that she didn't bargain for. And this is really, really common in ducks. And we call it brood parasitism, but within species. And it also happens in coots. So I know um, there, there's been a question about why certain baby birds like coots might have such colorful headgear, as it were, and the adults don't. And one of the brilliant experiments that's been done is to show that the head coloring seems to have evolved as a way of getting parental attention. So really, it's trying to look cute so that it gets more food from the parents. And coots also have intraspecific brood parasitism. So it's really in the interest of the offspring to um, try and get as much care as they can because there's also countervailing, um, there's a benefit to parents being very picky because otherwise they might end up raising more kids than they bargain for, a lot of which aren't theirs. And so there's a sort of evolutionary arms race going on between the coot chicks and the coot parents, which is. Um, fascinating to explore and there's, there's a lot more detail about this in the book. Um, there's also sibling rivalry so this is just a sketch I did of barns, barn owls to show that um, unlike a lot of songbirds, so unlike things like robins or chickadees, owls tend to start incubating the moment their first egg is laid and that creates a sort of size difference between the kids so that the oldest one can really bully the youngest one, which might not seem like a very good strategy, except if you think of the youngest chick as a sort of insurance for just in case the oldest one doesn't make it, then it's a good way for the parents to hedge their bets, even if it's not very great for the kids. Um, okay, another thing that I try to talk about in the book is the importance or the growing awareness of birds as individuals. So I think I might bring this up in the finding food section of understanding bird behavior. But this is a bird I got to know quite well in Kenya. His name is Vulture. He's an Egyptian vulture. 
And he featured in some of the earliest animal behavior papers on tool use. So again, we often think of things like crows as using tools, but Egyptian vultures were observed by Jane Goodall first, actually, as um, sort of hammering, using stones to open ostrich eggshells to get food. So that, that's a really cool example of tool use. Um, another example of birds as individuals and sort of in animal behavior now, there's a great focus on not just studying birds as species and assuming that everyone in the same species or the same population is identical, but looking at things like personality differences among birds. So here's a black billed magpie, and this study found that you tend to get bolder black billed magpie on elk picking off ticks, whereas, and, and on shy elk specifically, whereas the bolder elk don't really like to have anyone on them and chase birds away. And the very shy magpies don't go up to an elk. So it's a sort of interesting interspecies sort of mutualism where it only happens to some individuals in the population, not everyone, depending on their individual personalities. Um, this is just an example of what I thought was a very cool example of convergent evolution, but it's also in the finding food section. So there are some birds that are really, really important pollinators. And on the top corner, you've got the sunbird, which is what you see in Asia and Africa, where, where I grew up. Whereas uh, in the bottom corner, you've got the hummingbird, which is what in North America we're much more familiar with. And they've both convergently evolved on pollination and nectar feeding. Well, they on feed, eating nectar, and the pollination is a sort of byproduct. But um, in understanding bird behavior, I describe how one of my friends has basically figured out at the molecular level how the taste buds have evolved in hummingbirds to taste sweet things. And it's actually evolved from a gene for the umami receptor, which is the flavor you get from something like soy sauce or, or eating meat. So it's fascinating at the evolutionary level that you can modify a molecule from tasting um, umami, from tasting soy sauce to tasting sugar. Uh, there's also a bit about sort of when these partnerships turn sour, as it were, when, when there are cheetahs involved. So these are oxpeckers, and they're on a the buffalo in, in Africa. And usually oxpeckers are great. They're a bit like the magpies on the elk. They just eat the ticks. But sometimes <laughs> they're not enough ticks, or the buffalo is bleeding enough that it benefits oxpeckers to have a little blood meal as well as having the ticks. So, so that's, that's a bit of a cheating sort of relationship. And here's the North American equivalent, sort of. So these are brown-headed cowbirds on a bison. They aren't really after the ticks, but they do follow the bison around as, as a way of flushing up insects. And of course, they're well known as being brood parasites as well. So meaning they um, find the nests of birds like this Kirtland's warbler in Michigan. And they may lay their eggs in those nests. And the poor Kirtland's warbler has to raise these foundling offspring, which is, has resulted in sort of Kirtland's warblers almost going extinct. So that's one of these conservation success stories that I try to talk about in the book, uh, where people had to practically round up the cowbirds and kill them, as well as use, use controlled burns and cutting to, to get the Kirtland's warbler habitat exactly what to what the curtains wobbled like nesting. Um, this is another brood parasite. So this is one of the ones I studied. It's the, the, the grotesque thing in the corner, the, the sort of um, bill hooks on that greater honey guide chick look really lethal and they are lethal. So the, the really cute ones that look like Muppets are basically little bee eaters that grew up without having a greater honey guide parasite in the nest. But if they had gotten parasitized, they would have been slaughtered very fast within a day by that greater honey guide chick in the bottom right corner. Um, so, so how both the, there's a sort of evolutionary arms race between both um, the hosts, like the little bee eaters, and the brood parasites, the honey guides. That's that's another fascinating area of evolutionary biology which I try to get across. And just so you don't think honey guides are all bad, they're also part of this amazing uh, mutualism with humans. So 
the great honey guides. This is a real honey guide, live honey guide, completely wild. And it's been able to communicate with this, this man who's a honey hunter in Mozambique. Um, the birds literally lead people to honey and they communicate in ways that, com that explain to the human the distance and the direction and how close they are to a honey, to a beehive, so that the humans can take the bees hive down and sort of smoke out the bees and the honey guides like eating the wax from the beehive. So it's a win-win situation. The humans wouldn't be able to find the honey as easily and the honey guides wouldn't be able to get the bees away to enjoy the wax if the humans weren't there. So that's, that's a really fascinating um, example of the sort of bird-human relationship that's very, very old in Africa. And um, gosh, maybe I should just stop there. This is, I've, I've got a bit about migration as well. So these are just white stalks and um, that, that ridiculous, the, the image on the right is literally a stalk with a hunting spear from Africa through its neck. And that's one of the earliest evidence, pieces of evidence humans in Europe had that the white stalks, stalks migrated rather than, they used to think barnacle geese actually turned into barnacles in the winter in medieval times. So it must have, you know, it really blew their minds to see this bird with an African hunting spear through its neck. Uh, flying all the way back to Europe to nest and then getting shot by someone. And I just wanted to end on this image of a snow goose migration, which I used to see in Montana every year, I, every spring. Hopefully I'll get to see it again this spring. But that's just a sort of plug for, I think, there's a lot in the book about how citizen scientists can contribute data and especially with migratory timings and how birds are responding to climate change or to people putting out bird feeders or to other anthropogenic activities we're engaging in. Um, everyone as a, citizen, as a citizen scientist can contribute data to that. And I think on that note, I'll end with, with a few links that you can sort of see more pictures or photographs at and also to please support your local bookshop. Thank you. I'll take questions now. Um. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm here to ask you questions. Sorry for yeah, the delay. No worries. All right. I can see some too. Okay, cool. Good. Um, if there's one you really want to answer, feel free to jump in there. Mm -hmm. Our top one with a bunch of votes is, uh, can we infer anything about dinosaur behavior yeah. based on our increased understanding of birds? Yes, but I would say almost cooler is the opposite. Oh. That we, we're starting to, um, that we can infer a lot of bird how bird behavior got started from our increasing understanding of dinosaurs as well. Um, so, so one of the coolest findings that took place in Montana, actually, where they've got a lot of missile silos, is uh, this early dinosaur called the myosaur, where they found evidence of not just nesting and eggs, eggs arranged in a circle in a nest, but also that the adults were clearly incubating the eggs and taking care of the young. So they, they had a sort of series of eggs hatching and evidence that the parents had died on the nest um, from, from the fossils. So that's, that's really interesting, partly because we tend to think of a lot of birds as having both parents take care of their chicks and the nest. You know, they, they both are involved in rearing their chicks and feeding them and things like that. Um, and then that but if you look at things, birds that branched off in the bird emu tree earlier, like ostriches or emus or cassowaries, they tend to have the dads doing more of the care than the mum. And so you might imagine from that that dinosaurs could probably had largely paternal care rather than maternal care. And their, their closest relatives to sort of dinosaurs and birds that we have living now are crocodiles. And they have 
mostly maternal maternal care, but they do have nests too. So maybe you know, dads caring dads, stay at home dads was a bird bird invention early on. Fascinating. Thank you. All right. So our next question is: Are there similarities between human vocal cords and birds' vocalizing systems? That's a great question. No, there aren't that many. Um, the great thing for birds is they have two. They have equivalent of two voice boxes. So when we hear one of these, you know, wood thrushes or something like that singing, and it sounds incredibly complicated and com impossible to replicate for a human to replicate by singing or by whistling, that's really true because they, they can do two things at once, make two two sets of sounds at once. Um, also, the other cool thing about songbirds, especially, is to produce these songs, to learn them, to remember them, and to sort of execute them in this, the right order, to, to basically sing the right song. They've got these bits of the brain called song nuclei. So this is diverging from the vocal cord thing, but it's still, it's still hardware, right? And um, so there are a lot of, we know quite a lot about the neurobiology of birdsong now. But what I find amazing is how plastic their all their organs are, not just their brains, but in this case, the brains, where when they don't need these song nuclei, like in right now, when they're pretty much done with breeding and they're about to migrate or they're about to hunker down for winter, those song nuclei shrink in their brains. And then they grow again just before the breeding season so that the bird can sing again. And they do this for other bits of their brains. So right now, everyone's storing seeds if they're going to survive the winter. And so that part of the brain, which we share, the hippocampus, which is really good for spatial memory, that um, basically grows and shrinks seasonally as well. Fascinating. All right. Okay. So our next question is, uh, is the common merganser yeah. female leaving eggs yeah. in another bird's nest also maintaining her own nest? And can the converse be true yeah. for the unwitting messenger mom? Can she also, is she also dropping eggs elsewhere? Yes, so pretty much um, that, that's basically yes. <laughs> that's very often the case. Um, there's also been really interesting work done on common eiders, which is another kind of duck, but they tend to live, well, eider down. So if you have a beautiful, soft eider down quilt, this is coming from eiders, which are much more seabirds than the common meganza. And in those cases, there's a lot of what you might call egg dumping as well. But what's cool is the eggs often get dumped in the nests of related females. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you're not parasitizing as much because it's, it's more like you end up being reared by your aunt or your grandmother instead mm -hmm. of someone who's absolutely got no uh, genetic relation to you. But yeah, otherwise it's it's a bit of a it's a bit like the fairy wrens having these extra pair populations. Every male is off copulating with a different female in the morning. So mm -hmm. it sort of evens out, even if you're not ending up taking care of your own genetic offspring. And so the 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 birds that are taking care of or raising eggs that aren't their own, they don't they don't seem to treat the the chicks differently. Um, do they? Is there any sort of evidence of them trying to suss out yeah. which ones are that their is. own versus which ones have been dumped yeah, on them? That is. That, that's a brilliant question. So, so the the general answer with all these things is it depends. In this case, it depends a lot on the species and on mm -hmm. the cost of raising some kid that's not yours, right? Yeah. So, with something like the common meganses, the the ducklings are really independent by the time they hatch they, they're sort of able to find their own food so it's very low cost to having a few extra in fact it might be not so bad for them the sort of carer in the sense that she's diluting the chances of her own offspring being picked off by a predator or something if she's got a bigger group of them right so it might be safety in numbers or something right so so there are also some benefits, whereas um, in something like those greater honey guides where they're par parasitizing a much smaller species or brown-headed cowbird, they often parasitize a smaller species and they always kill the offspring of the, the foster parent. Then, then it's really bad news to have a parasite in the nest and then you really 
there would be very strong selection to identify the parasite and get rid of it if you can. Or, or you better still prevent the parasite from nest, laying its egg in your nest at all. Mm -hmm. And something like the coots with their colorful heads is like an intermediate. So we think that the colorful heads on those coot chicks are colorful because there has been, there is an attempt by a lot of parents to kill chicks that are not their own, kill chicks that were dumped in there by some other female. And so that selects for the chicks to make themselves as appealing as they possibly can yeah. to avoid being killed, basically. Um, it's a fascinating, fascinating system. It's not very nice, but yeah. Absolutely, thank you. That's, it's certainly fascinating, but yeah, not, not necessarily very nice. Um, Another maybe not so nice question from Laurel. In the West, we are experiencing significant yeah. fires right now. Do you have any data or information on how major wildfires may impact migration? I don't, and I wish people, I, I was just looking into this yesterday because it seems like an obvious thing to look at. <laughs> um, but we don't, we only know something about how fires, wildfires, in, um, impact birds later, be largely because there's some birds that are sort of fire specialists in terms of liking the habitat that fires leave behind, lots of dead trees and lots of yeah. um, you know, things like black-backed woodpeckers. But the smoke definitely has an impact on bird lungs and everything else, the, the way it does on ours. Um, and I imagine that the smoke would also impact migration just because it would make things harder for the birds to see. I suspect it would also make a lot of birds start migrating earlier if they could. But I don't think that's been well measured. Uh, but I do try and include in the book several ways in which biologists are sort of now having the tools to measure migration for really, really small birds. So we can now stick transmitters onto really small birds when we couldn't before. And also use things like radar to sort of track bird migration. So I think the data are there. We've just not quite gotten, um, it's, no one's produced a study that answers that question clearly. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you. Our next question, have you learned or changed anything about yourself as a human or as an individual after studying birds in such detail? I think I've definitely learned a lot, but I think I probably started all this so early that it's very hard to, you know, it's like asking someone who's grown up with a certain religion, if they changed much, it's just hard to Hard to do. I haven't done the experiment. You'd have to <laughs> ask me if I, if I was um, much younger. But I, I think it really helps me um, see everything from a fairly detached perspective. In in terms, even even with my personal life. I mean, if I'm sort of having problems with other people, not getting on with other people for whatever reason, um, it it helps me take a step back and sort of think, oh well. They probably they probably have reasons that are quite evolutionarily well that, that make evolutionary sense for for their behavior or something and um, it, it it helps me make a joke out of it or not take it too seriously. That's great. I appreciate that perspective. Um, all right, another question. So um, this is from Joan. Why did my Amazon parrot? <laughs> Oh, why did my Amazon parrot get frightened when I oh, wore a yeah. scarf for the first time, despite being with me for over 10 years? Oh, wow. I, I, I don't know. I mean, what, what color? It, the, my guess is it either didn't like the shape or didn't like the color. Um, but yeah, you suppose you could do experiments with this. You could try different colored scarves. You could see how how you wore the scarf that made a difference, or whether it's, you know, I think of a lot of horses or dogs as getting upset if there's something flapping. Um, so so maybe the scarf was flapping, but I, I have no idea. All right. 
Joan, you got an experiment to do at home with your parents. <laughs> um, our next question is from Max, who asks, any same-sex bird relationships recorded and yes. what does it mean? Yes, plenty. And Great. a good question. And I've got that in the books too. Um, yes, plenty of same-sex bird relationships. Very often um, it results from a sort of both so, so one of the best examples is lays and albatross, which live in Hawaii. And people noticed that there were some albatross pairs with two eggs, which is basically usually impossible because a female, the, the eggs are so large and so expensive to lay that females only lay one egg at a time in the breeding season. And they had to take like a couple of years break and everything. So if you've got two eggs, it kind of means you've got two females. And uh, so these biologists have been watching these birds and um, in, it usually results in both females having lost their partner for some reason. And so it makes more sense to get together than to try and go it alone because there's no way a single albatross can raise a chick on her own. She, it's just too much work. She can't do it. Um, and so it's that those two females end up not raising as many offspring successfully as a male and a female. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, but but they do they do form long term pair bonds because albatross often do. So you'll see the females do a lot of the same kind of albatross courtship routines that cement the pair bond, and they'll stay together for years a lot of the time. I don't think there's enough data to know if they get much better after staying together for longer, but that's the case for a lot of birds that form long term pair bonds, including a lot of albatross. So I imagine they would get better at it um, if they stay together for longer, get, get better at raising kids. I mean. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, okay. Our next question is from Gerald. Um, and Gerald asks, have you been noticing any evolutionary changes coinciding with climate change? Yes. Um, there's, there's a bunch of that as well. I mean, some of it's um, not immediately evolutionary change. It's more, it's more changes in species distributions and things like that. But um, there's there's a really burgeoning field of what we call urban ecology, where people are really looking at the effects of things like light pollution and noise pollution on on bird behavior. And some of the most obvious evolutionary changes, I would guess, are to do with um, migratory changes. And I think some of those are beyond behavioral changes. They would be sort of selected, um, selection under genes. One, one of the, this is not an incomplete story, but there's a bird called the pied, fl pied flycatcher, which is a very common songbird in Europe. And they've literally changed the, their mate, mating preferences in some way because of climate, we think climate change is a bit correlative. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I can't even remember the exact direction, but I think it used to be that males with a larger white forehead were sexier and got more mates. And that has reversed direction with climate change, but why we don't really know. So it's a bit unsatisfying as a story. Uh, but back to the barn swallows, there also seems to be a sort of climate change related angle there where, um, let me see, males that, males that have longer tails don't tend to make be as such good dads and that doesn't matter so much now that nests don't have to be so well insulated because things are warmer i think that's the way it goes so uh, but yeah that, that there seems to be an interaction definitely between climate change and sort of not just physical adaptations but behavior as well Great, thank you. Good, good question. All right, our next one. How do cowbirds get their eggs into the nests of dark-eyed oh. juncos? Yeah, such a good question. So all these brood parasites, including cowbirds, um, the, the females are really impressive. They monitor the nests of their host species. So in this case, dark-eyed juncos. And they sort of keep tabs on all these different nests in their territory and they see what stage the eggs the females are at in terms of egg laying and 
and and they they basically wait for the right moment and then they're really sneaky about it they so they tend to lay the eggs at dawn or sort of very first early very early and they'll they're very quick about it so they'll sort of wait till no one's at home and then they'll fly in and sort of pop the egg out and fly out again and cowbirds often take an egg with them so do a lot of cuckoos uh, that, that's basically how they get their eggs in but it's it's amazingly fast so i watched the honey guide in zambia doing this before and and she was in and out in two seconds flat it was really impressive um and the other the other thing that they do to help them with this sort of monitoring of nests is like the birds that um, grow the hippocampus, so the part of the brain that has spatial memory for keeping tabs on where they've stored their seeds for the winter. Cowbird females actually grow the, that spatial memory bit of their brains for, for nestling, for eggling in the spring. Um, yeah, and then the, there's also a really cool adaptation that they've got where they sort of monitor the nests even after they've laid the eggs. So if a bird, such as the junco toss the eggs out the cowbird will come back and destroy the nest and force these poor host parents to lay and to to nest again and to give the cowbird another chance to to lay the eggs oh boy I know. <laughs> all <Good> right <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. We got another one. I think I think this is kind of a related question. So mm. in your study of family squabbles, did you discover that birds in a group may kill another in the group? Oh, wow. In the group. Huh. I don't know. I, I don't know of any re records of that. That's a, wow. I mean, that's within the group yeah i think that's pretty rare mm -hmm. there are examples of um so so one of the things i write about is which i thought was very cool is kidnapping where there are there in some of these cooperative breeders nannies sort of child cares help with child care at such a premium that if you didn't produce enough kids of your own to serve as nannies when they get when they grow up you you literally go to a neighboring group and kidnap their kids wow. and lure them over the border into your territory. Um, but that's not that's not outright killing. That's just squabbling. Um, I mean the the only the only example really is at the at the sibling stage. So mm -hmm. newly hatched egrets would almost always one sibling will kill kill its other sibling. So that there's only one kid left in the nest, and um, they always do that. It's like it's it's hardwired in them to to always kill a sibling. So they they tend to have two start off with two and end up with one kid. But once they're adults, I don't I don't think it, it gets that extreme to have group members kill another group member. Um, yeah. Good for the birds, I think. Um, yeah, okay. if you, if you just talk to children. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, since we're at 8.30, I think we'll maybe make this our last question. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. All right, so our last question is from Haley, and Haley asks, how did you first get interested in birds? Oh my, that, that's pretty quick. So I, I think, so when I was really young, um, because I grew up in a city, I think I really liked IDing things and sort of animals, but I didn't have much of an outfit for it. So I, I memorized dog breeds and uh, and sort of ID dog breeds in the city. And um, I also ID all these ant African antelope on TV uh, when watching documentaries or something. But uh, a yellow vented bulbul, which is like the East Asian equivalent of a robin, very, very confiding and they nest right next to people and often low down it nested right outside my window um and i was about 12 and i just i mean that really opened my eyes to the fact that birds were everywhere and even in a city they're everywhere so i wanted to know what it was and you know, one thing led to another i and I had some great mentors who introduced me to bird watching and who got me bird books and so that's how it started 
Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for um, spending your evening with us tonight, oh, sharing you. about your book and, and answering so many questions. It was really fun. Yeah, thank you. And I want to, you know, thank our audience for joining us and asking so many wonderful questions. Yeah, really good questions. Yeah. Um, everybody, please check out, buy the book, get it from our friends at Third Place Books. Um, please support your our local booksellers here in town. Um, Wen Fei, is there anything you want to leave our audience with before we say good night? Uh, good luck with the wildfires, and I hope you keep seeing birds and enjoying birds. Same, very much same. All right, thank you so much, Wen Fei. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night. Stay safe. Bye.